you're listening to another episode of HC Daily, a daily devotional podcast that you can listen to at home or on the go. We believe that you can grow as much as you want to grow spiritually, and this podcast can be a part of your daily growth plan. So, whether you're watching on YouTube, listening on Spotify, or your favorite podcast app, we're glad you're here. Now, let's join our hosts, Jeff Forrester and Chris Zarbaugh in the studio. So Chris, here we are sitting on the stage at Heritage Church. Yes, we are, because one of the files got corrupted from the podcast that we recorded last week. Why? What did you say on the file that was so corrupt? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's shocking, Chris. Let now, me just say. What, what, what our listeners may not know is, actually, we record these in advance. So on this particular day, we actually are in the middle of our Easter services. That's right. As a matter of fact, we just finished up uh, four services on Saturday. Yeah, and so I did the first two, which were really fantastic. Right. And then he just, you know, brought up the rear end on and the And brought it right two. up over top. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, you kind of tossed it up there, and I alley-ooped it, dunked yeah, it. Yeah, well, right? you tried so your best. It, it was, was it, yeah. It was really good. It's fine. So, uh, anyways, we had already recorded this episode. Yes. And then the Lord decided he thought we could do better. Yeah. And so he's having us re-record it. That's right. That's what we're doing. And so today we're covering the betrayal of Jesus uh, from the garden to uh, the arrest and the illegal trials, and then including the interactions with Barabbas and Pontius the Pilate. That's correct. So we're going to read uh, John chapter 18. We're going to go one through just whenever I'm ready to be done. It sounds great. So verse 40, I Take think. Take it away, buddy. Here we go. So it says in John chapter 18, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, after saying these things, Jesus crossed the Kidron Valley with his disciples and entered a grove of olive trees. Judas, the betrayer, knew this place because Jesus had often gone there with his disciples. The leading priests and Pharisees had given Judas a contingent of Roman soldiers and temple guards to accompany him. Now, with blazing torches, lanterns, and weapons, they arrived at the olive grove. Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him, which is such a cool phrase, by the way. Mm -hmm. So he stepped forward to meet them. Who are you looking for, he asked. Jesus the Nazarene, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. As Jesus said, I am he, they all drew back and fell to the ground. Once more, he asked them, who are you looking for? And again, they replied, Jesus the Nazarene. I told you that I'm he, Jesus said, and since I am the one you want, let these others go. He did this to fulfill his own statement. I did not lose a single one of those you have given me. Then Simon Peter drew a sword and slashed off the right ear of Malchus, the high priest's slave. But Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering the father has given me? So the soldiers, their commanding officer and the temple guards arrested Jesus and tied him up. First, they took him to Annas since he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest at the time. Caiaphas was the one who had told the other Jewish leaders it's better than one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, as did another of the disciples. That other disciple was acquainted with the high priest, so he was allowed to enter the high priest's courtyard with Jesus. Peter had to stay outside the gate, and then the disciple who knew the high priest spoke to the woman watching at the gate, and she let Peter in. The woman asked Peter, you're not one of the man's, that man's disciples, are you? No, he said, I am not. Because it was cold, the household servants and the guards had made a charcoal fire. They stood around it, warming themselves, and Peter stood with them, warming himself. Inside, the high priest began asking Jesus about his followers and what he had been teaching them. And Jesus replied, everyone knows what I teach. I've preached regularly in the synagogues and the temple where the people gather. I've not spoken in secret. Why are you asking me this question? Ask those who heard me. They know what I said. Then one of the temple guards standing nearby slapped Jesus across the face. Is that the way to answer the high priest, he demanded? And Jesus replied, if I said anything wrong, you must prove it. But if I'm speaking the truth, why are you beating me? Then Annas bound Jesus and sent him to Caiaphas, the high priest. Meanwhile, as Simon Peter was standing by the fire warming himself, they asked him again, you're not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, saying, no, I'm not. But one of the household slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, didn't I see you out there in the olive grove with Jesus? And again, Peter denied it, and immediately a rooster crowed. Jesus' trial before Caiaphas ended in the early hours of the morning. Then he was taken to the headquarters of the Roman governor. His accusers didn't go inside because it would defile them, and they wouldn't be allowed to celebrate the Passover. So Pilate, the governor, went out to them and asked, what is your charge against this man? We wouldn't have handed him over to you if he weren't a criminal, they retorted. Then take him away and judge him by your own law, Pilate told them. Only the Romans are permitted to execute someone, the Jewish leaders replied. This fulfilled Jesus' prediction about the way he would die. Then Pilate went back to his headquarters and called for Jesus to be brought to him. Are you the king of the Jews? 
he asked him, and Jesus replied, Is this your own question, or did others tell you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate retorted. Your own people and their leading priests brought you to me for trial. Why? What have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate said, So you are a king. And Jesus responded, You say I'm a king. Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. What is truth? Pilate asked. And then he went out again to the people and told them, he's not guilty of any crime, but you have a custom of asking me to release one prisoner each year at Passover. Would you like me to release this king of the Jews? But they shouted back, no, not this man. We want Barabbas. And Barabbas was a revolutionary. Yeah, so... um yeah, so we have a lot going on here. So we have, uh, it starts in the garden, and then it goes through all the way through, uh, as we mentioned before. So, uh, geez, there's uh, several different things that I want to point out. And uh, <laughs> the first thing is this, that um, uh, here they are, and they have a conversation with Jesus when he goes to get arrested. And they ask him, are you Jesus, you know, of Nazareth? And he says, I am he. And it says the yeah. soldiers fell over. That's one of the coolest parts of this whole story, right? Yeah. There's, there's a lot of other elements, but the power of him saying, I am, hmm. just totally knocks them to their knees. Uh, let, let's, let's talk about the power of this because it says that Judas comes out with a cohort of soldiers. Now, a cohort, according to my notes, a Roman cohort would have been one-tenth of a legion. Mm -hmm. So that would mean in Judas's group, there were somewhere between 300 and 600 soldiers <laughs> come out to arrest one, one guy. Yeah. Right? And, and as we mentioned before in the podcast, uh, this was during Passover week and the Romans were, car uh, you know, charged with keeping the peace, which means if there is to be a revolution, you know, with zealots often yeah. uprising, you know, they, they, who knows? They could have thought that there were, Jesus was there waiting for them with people in the woods, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so, uh, so yeah, to go out there, they were doing everything they could to keep the peace and, and just to make sure that this king of the Jews who rode in on a donkey. Yeah wasn't going to have a revolution. Or they could have anticipated the fact that, you know, when Jesus had just come in on the donkey, all these thousands of people celebrating, they could have anticipated if we arrest him, how hard is it going to be for us to get him back inside the city walls? Yeah. Get him to jail, right? That's so, true. So it may have been more, not so much about the threat they felt of Jesus, but the threat of the followers of yeah, Jesus. That could be true. I, yeah, I agree with you on that. Yeah. And so he says, I am he. And, and actually it's because uh, he said, uh, I am. Which, yeah. is, which is actually what uh, God's name said. It was his name for himself back yeah. in Exodus chapter 20 yep. when Moses asked the burning bush and said, who are you? And the Lord through the burning bush said, I am who I am, right? right? I am Yahweh. who I am, right, right. Yeah, Yahweh. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, so, uh, and so Jesus quotes this and that's where the blasphemy comes in because right. he, he says, I am, and they say blasphemy and they, they immediately know that he's <laughs> equating himself with the God of Moses. Right, and so the power that comes out of Jesus' mouth is incredible. The power of the word of God, mm -hmm. the power of the name of Christ is so incredibly powerful that it knocks these soldiers. These aren't just, you know, little Twinkies. Yeah. These are professional soldiers, knocks them to their feet or to the ground. And then they start to stand back up and he says, oh, I was just asking you guys, who are you looking for? He asks them a second time, yeah. which is such a cool move, yeah, right? Yeah, dare you say it again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you want me to say it again? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And he announces his name, I am he, right? So at that point, but I love what happens just before that. They come out with clubs and swords and torches. Literally, these people are coming with torches looking for the light of the world, which is mm. a phenomenal concept. But they come out... Uh, with, with all these, this weaponry and all these, these issues looking to grab a hold of a guy that they think are, is doing something totally opposite hmm. from his mission. Yeah, and I, and I love to, to point out as well that, that Judas kisses Jesus mm -hmm. and he betrays him with a kiss. And so it must have been customary, uh, if you think about how intimate that is, yeah, yeah. you know, for people to come up and, you know, and greet a master, you know, by kissing him on, on either cheek, uh, you know, that was, that was a normal greeting. And perhaps Judas uh, didn't want Jesus to let him know that, you know, he was with the soldiers, like, hey, these guys followed me, you know, yeah. and, 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 but he told the soldiers, the one I kiss is the one yeah. who it is. And so he kisses him and then, you know, Jesus looks at him and says, you betrayed the son of man with a kiss. Right. You know, it's like, it's like Caesar. It's like et tu brute, you know, right. and you too, Brutus. Right. You know, so. It's, it's one of the most uh, base demonstrations of treachery 
in all of human history. Maybe only Brutus would be the other one that even be close. Yeah. The idea that somebody was his close friend who kisses him to betray him. Now, it's not like Jesus didn't know what was going on. There's 600 soldiers there too, mm. right? But it, I think he kisses him for a number of reasons. One, I think because he was so twisted, he was anticipating some kind of deception or something. And so he stepped in. The other one is maybe he didn't want to tip his hand to everybody else that he was the betrayer. But hey, Jesus, these guys followed me out into the bush, right? Yeah. To come and find you. Now, they were in the Garden of Gethsemane, which um, is outside the city walls, not very far, but outside the city walls. Um, because in that time, the Passover, there would have been millions of people in this town that really would only have you know, 50 or 100,000 people normally. Now there's a couple million people and it's everybody camping in tents and, and, you know, shelters that they built up all around the city. And so this is the garden that it paired, appears to be that Jesus really enjoyed going to, went mm -hmm. to often. Judas knew where he was camping and that's why he comes out to this place, yeah. right? Yeah. And the garden, by the way, is visible from the city of Jerusalem. Yeah. So the city of Jerusalem sits on a hill and it goes down and Jesus would have walked through the vineyard where he taught John 15, I'm the vine, you are the branch. And he would have walked all the way up and then looking almost in direct sight is the garden of Gethsemane. So yeah. they would have seen him yeah. uh, and then brought him back. So, um, and, uh, and then let's talk about as well, uh, he has this interaction uh, where he stands in front of Pilate and it says, you know, they ask him, uh, these questions, and it says one of the temple guards nearby slapped Jesus across the face. I mean, he did yeah. a full-on Will Smith. Yeah. Oh no, <laughs> no, that's what that guy did, right? The, the the thing. So it wasn't Pilate's house; it was Annas's house. The the former high priest. That's right. Is, that's is right. what happened. Yeah. So what what you have happening here is Annas had been the high priest. Caiaphas, his son-in-law, is the current high priest. But the Jews did not recognize that. What happened was the priests really had shifted from just serving God in the temple to becoming a political class, actually a political party. And they were negotiating and had negotiated a certain amount of peace with the Romans uh, in exchange for the priests making sure that they were pushing people towards following the laws. Um, so the Romans would appoint high priests. And Annas made them mad. So they fired him and they appointed Caiaphas, but the people still viewed him as the high priest. Right. And so that's why he said, bring him in here. And he's the one who sets him up. He's the one who's trying to set Jesus up. He's more crafty. He's a little more slick. He's trying to set Jesus up. And then after they smack Jesus and they feel like Jesus starts crossing a line, this was like the trial before the trial. They send him to Caiaphas for the official, you know, uh, uh, de declaration from the Jews, but the yeah. Jews couldn't kill people. They could put them in prison. They could have them beaten. They could torture them, but they could not, you know, um, uh, execute somebody which, without the Romans. Which is why we need to probably mention that that's the reason why the Jewish leaders who wanted Jesus dead uh, had tried to push this forward, and they did it illegally. Yeah. They did it uh, in haste. They did it. Uh, there was it, it was not founded, and they were trying their very best to get Pilate to order this the sentencing and the death. And and Pilate, of course, didn't want to. Right. All he, all Pilate knew was. These religious leaders who I've known and been over uh, want this guy dead. And they were trying to rush it through to the Sabbath because right. the Sabbath was coming up. Passover. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah, and, right. and so they, they, had to, they had to get everything done quickly. And so everything was done illegally. Everybody knew it. Right. And so that's why Pilate looks at him and says, what have you done? And then Jesus and he have a conversation. And I, and I also love how uh, Jesus says, hey, uh, if I were really an earthly king, I would have enough soldiers to come and defend me, yeah. right? And, and, and this is, maybe I watch too much movies, but I actually, in, in my mind, envision like this, like Hollywood version of Jesus proving who he is oh, standing, yeah. in front of, yeah, yeah. standing in front of uh, Pilate, where he just sort of like looks up and squints, you know, with his rock, you know, like this jawline, and he just kind of nods, and then the clouds open up, and, you know, 40,000 or 70,000 70, angels yes, 70, uh, come down, you know, with flaming swords and just take everybody out. Right. And he's like, you know, I'm one, but which, by the way, it does happen in Revelation. It does. To a sure certain does. degree, yeah. But. So he, he literally says uh, in another passage, uh, don't you know I could call 12 legions of angels? Right, which right? is 72,000. He, he, yeah, he's telling Peter, hey, put your sword away, dude. I don't, need to, mm -hmm. I don't need you to defend me. How noble is it? How courageous is Peter? Yeah. That, you know, we got 600 guys maybe, and he pulls out his sword, and he's going to... He's like a fishing's dagger, a fisherman's dagger. Yeah. He's like, hey, yeah, whack. Cuts the guy's ear off, right? That's pretty amazing. And he, and he looks around and goes, who's next? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And Jesus is like, come on, man. If I needed to, I'd call 72,000 angels. Now, to put that in perspective, there's a time in the Old Testament when God sends an angel 
and one angel kills 70,000 people, 75,000 people. Right. So to think about the power, these 600 guys would have no chance. The entire Roman Empire. Well, the earth. Would have no, right. Yeah. It's just staggering to think the amount of power at Jesus' fingertips. And this is him hinting at, again, nobody's going to take my life from me. This isn't happening. It's not a surprise to me. That's why Jesus said he knew what was happening. That's what it, it says in the passage. He knew what was happening. And he steps in front of his disciples mm -hmm. and says, well, if you found me already, let these other guys go. Yeah. And he had all the confidence of all the power of God at his disposal. He knew exactly what was happening. He's fulfilling all these prophecies. God was never out of control through the entire process. And so Jesus is offering up his life all the way to the cross. We'll see where he lays his life down. They don't even take his life from him. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's tackle sort of the last interaction we're with this prisoner called Barabbas. Yeah. So Pilate stands in front of Jesus. He, he finds no fault in him. So he decides to, one, in one de last desperate hope, he decides to offer to the crowd because he's, he wants to say at the end of the day, I've done everything I can on my end. Right. I wash, that's why he said, I wash my hands of this because yeah, yeah. I've done everything I can. But he still yet gives in yeah. knowing that it's, uh, you know, it's, it's all illegal and it's just what they want. And he gives in to that. But he puts him in front of the crowd and says, who do you want? Do you want Barabbas, who's a known murderer right. and a revolutionary, yeah. uh, versus Jesus, the king of the Jews? Mm -hmm. and, then, and then all of a sudden, we are faced with this idea that the crowd shouts back, yeah. uh, you know, release Barabbas. Mm -hmm. So we have no choice but to believe that the religious leaders have somehow, uh, trying to push their agenda, have sort of, you know, they already had power over the people anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that they have somehow coerced the people and threatened them or, or maybe the people just knew, hey, I better go with the winner. Yeah. Right? I better go with what the religious leaders want because we have to live here after this guy's gone. Or they were making politically expedient decisions at that point. That when Jesus was coming in, he's the king. He's the, the heir to the throne of David. That's, what, that's a triumphal entry. And yay, king of the Jews, you're here to rescue us. And then now he's arrested and he didn't do anything. Nobody right. came and rescued him. So now there's an expediency to the idea of, hey, we're going to throw in with where the power's at. And so... Hey, if you're giving us a choice, we'd rather have this relig or this uh, nationalist, this zealot, Barabbas. He's a murderer, but he killed a Roman, so what do we care, right? That's what we want back. And instead, Jesus apparently, in their minds, isn't delivering on the kingdom that they were hoping for. Yeah. And so I think it's interesting. Pilate, uh, three different times, declared that Jesus was innocent. Mm -hmm. Three different times. Even in this passage, one time right. he does. But when you combine all four of the Gospels, three different times, he says... I don't understand what this is about. Yeah, I find he, no he, fault in this man. Right, he takes him in and he interrogates him over the one issue, are you really a king? Mm -hmm. That's the only thing Rome can, cared about. They didn't care about if Jesus had committed blasphemy or claimed to be God. They didn't care about any of that because the Romans had declared that all the other nations had to worship the Roman gods, but they had given an exception yeah. to the Jews. So the Jews could worship whatever God they wanted to worship. So at that point, he's like, hey, this isn't my issue. Oh, you're a king? Let's talk about that for a minute. Right. And Jesus goes, listen, man, my king, kingdom's not of this earth. And Pilate's like, this guy's nuts. Okay, right. I don't know what you guys want me to do. He's not, he's not guilty. And so he thought with the big you know, celebration of Jesus coming into town just a couple days earlier, he thought, well, the, this is the way I don't have to kill Jesus, mm. is the people will demand it. I'll give him this horrible person or this good guy. Yeah. And it's clear that Pilate thought Jesus was a good guy. Uh, this plus five. Yeah. So, uh, so I, here's what I thought. I thought, I, I heard a sermon one time on Barabbas, and I've never forgotten it, and it's always stuck with me. And what I realized was Barabbas was very symbolic, because in the end, we are Barabbas. Yes. Because Barabbas was a person who was guilty, yep. and he deserved the punishment according right. to the law. And instead of him going and paying the punishment, the Son of God takes his place and gets punished and dies in the way that Barabbas should have, and he died in his place. Yeah. And so Barabbas then is free. All of a sudden he finds himself, uh, didn't earn it, he yeah. didn't deserve it, and he finds himself free. And what I realize is, and again, I've never forgotten it, that we are Barabbas. And so it's a really emotional and strong you know, passage of scripture when they say free, free, you know, free, free Barabbas yeah. mm -hmm. and Barabbas goes free and Jesus takes his place. There are some uh, traditions within Christianity that Barabbas eventually became a Christian, became a follower of Jesus. How beautiful would that be if that's true, mm -hmm. right? Who better to know 
the innocent died in place of the guilty mm. than Barabbas, right? Yeah. So we can't know for sure that that's true, not till we get to heaven, but there are some church traditions that say that he did become a Christian yeah. uh, and a follower of Christ later. That would be an amazing an incredible thing, yeah. It'd be just like Jesus to do that. Yeah, of course. Way, right? of course. So. Well, so uh, I think we can wrap this up. And so if we were to just have maybe a final thought for our listeners as they consider Jesus being betrayed all the way through, you know, getting tried illegally. I don't know, what, what are some of the things that they could take home? Jesus steps in front of the people he loved to protect them, even in the most dangerous moment, mm. to his own life. He had all the power of heaven at his disposal, and he willingly gave his life for us. And as we just, you know, have come through Easter, mm. I think that's never highlighted more than Good Friday and Easter, right? And then... I think a, a big one is he willingly accepted the cup that the father had for him right? Uh, because he knew it was the only way. Yeah. And thank God Jesus had the courage. Certainly he had the godly mandate mm. and he had the desire when he was in heaven to come down to earth to rescue us. But the humanity of this is pretty horrifying. And he willingly did it anyways. And so thank God for yeah, what Jesus God. did for us. And I would just throw one last thought in there. And I would say, you know, him even being silent before Pilate. Uh, Isaiah 53 says, just as a sheep is silent before its shearers. Mm -hmm. So he did not open his mouth. I would say Jesus all the way through all of this, even though he was on the receiving end of something that was unjust and unfair and everything else, he, he was careful to fulfill every single prophecy uh, in every small way, which means to us, like God is faithful to fulfill the promises that he makes. Yeah. So Jesus demonstrates that. He models that for us. And it's also true for us as we learn to trust our God's promises going to be fulfilled in our lives. And we could bank on it based on what Jesus did. That's right. Now, of course, we've already celebrated Easter by the time we're doing this podcast or listening to this podcast, right? right? So we know how it turns out, yes. right? Um, but this day was very real in Jesus' yeah. life. So, Okay. Yeah. Well, hey, listen, we'll see you on Tuesday for uh, the recordings that we recorded actually last week. That's right. <laughs> it's going to be good. We'll see you then. Thank you for joining us today. If you enjoyed this podcast, please help us spread the word by liking this episode and sharing it on your social media platforms. Be sure to leave a comment and review, and don't forget to give us five stars. When you do, you help us reach even more people who need a daily devotional like HC Daily. If you'd like to hear more from Chris and Jeff, they're both teaching pastors at Heritage Church, located in Southeast Michigan. You can get more of their messages by clicking on the Messages tab at heritagechurch.com. Be sure to join us again soon for another episode of HC Daily.